The Forest, Stevie Wonder, The Monkees, The Jackson 5, The Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, or One Direction. There was Frankie Lyman and The Teenagers. Frankie and The Teenagers were the prototype for today's boy bands. Frankie, the star, was snatched from the slums of Harlem at the age 13 and catapulted into national prominence. And it's safe to say that Frankie Lyman was one of the most influential and talented figures early in the music industry. Unfortunately, he met the fate of most other child stars, a treacherous adulthood filled with addiction and eventually an overdose at 25. Nevertheless, Frankie had a once-in-a-lifetime career, and since his death has been dubbed a classic case of a child star unable to cope with fame. But his story is often confused, and as a person, he was misunderstood. This is the tragic tale of Frankie Lyman, America's first teenage rock star. Early Life September 30th, 1942, Washington Heights, New York. A maid and a truck driver would have their first child, Frankie Joseph Lyman. Frankie would grow up in Harlem and had three brothers. The family was musical, with his parents being part of a gospel group called The Harmonies, and Frankie's brothers would take after him singing as well. As a neighborhood, Harlem has a history of economic deprivation, and that environment made Frankie tough and hustler from a young age. In the interview, he'd say, I was a man when I was 11 years old, doing everything most men do. In the neighborhood where I lived, there was no time Time to be a child. He had to help make ends meet. So at the age of 10, Frankie was already working at a neighborhood grocery store saying, while most kids my age were playing ball and marbles, I was working the grocery store helping pay rent. On top of that, at a young age, Frankie was already engaging in activities even most adults wouldn't dare do. As a kid, he was hustling prostitutes saying, I remember when I was 10, I made a good living hustling prostitutes for white men that would come up to Harlem looking for black girls. I'd get a commission for every customer I brought him, and said, Sometimes they'd pay me off with something extra. Frankie wasn't just using his grocery store money to help his family out either. Smoking pot was a common place for kids where he grew up, even among young teenagers, and Frankie started in grade school. Journey in Music When Frankie was young, he joined a church group, learned to sing, and was even playing the drums. One day in school, he saw a group called the Coup de Ville at a talent show. The Coup de Ville were a local doo-wop group of black and Puerto Rican kids. Frankie begged them for months to join their group, and a month before his 13th birthday, they obliged. As a group, they changed their name multiple times from the premieres to the harmonies and finally the teenagers. Frankie wasn't even the lead singer at first. He was a backup in the quartet and this time Lyman was in eighth grade and the teenagers were sophomores. They grew up in New York in the early 50s. Those days singing on street corners was the thing to do and it was how people got noticed. Doo-wop was to kids back then what rap is today. The teenagers would sing at the grocery store with Frankie every day harmonizing on the street corners till the neighbors called the cops on them. Frankie's mother used to come and holler, Frankie, it's nine time to come home. One day, a well-known singer, Richard Barnett of the Valentines, moved to their area. They took advantage of the opportunity and sang for him. He was shook by the vocals and agreed to let them audition for G Records. When he originally took them down to the record company, they didn't want to record them because they were kids and were worried about issues with the school board. However, Lyman's voice shocked the owner. George Goldner, who said as long as they put Frankie at the lead, they would have themselves a deal. They were just kids though, so their parents would sign the deal with three lawyers, which gave the kids an allowance and sent the rest of the money to a trust for when they were 21. Their group dynamic between Frankie and the quartet later served as the model for Motown's early groups, as well as Michael Jackson's Jackson 5 from when he was a kid. Their first release, Why Do Fools Fall In Love, was originally titled Why Do The Birds Sing So Gay? But they they were told to change the name. So Frankie and Herman Santiago worked on some of the lyrics and the song was renamed Why Do Fools Fall In Love. This detail is important for later on for why the rest of the teenagers never got paid. The teenagers used to sing in the hallways and one day a man came out of his apartment and said, I'm tired of you guys constantly singing the same song in front of my door. So he gave him a poem called Why Do Birds Sing So Gay. They changed some of the song and they had a new song Why Do Fools Fall In Love. They wrote it as schoolboys during lunch. The song went number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and went number one in the UK. They were wildly 
popular. A parade of girls would come past the block and try to see Frankie and one of the teenagers. Pretty soon, they were appearing at all 48 states, some of the biggest theaters, TV. They were the first real crossover group. They appealed to everyone. Black, white, Hispanics? Boris Levy, the other owner of G Records, began managing the group as well, and would eventually be responsible for separating the group. In 1956, Frankie and the teenagers released nine singles and performed at the biggest rock and roll show. There, Frankie became close with Zola Taylor, a member of another famous group, The Platters, and they had intercourse on tour while they had a five-year age gap. Frankie would later go on to regularly have intercourse with girls twice his age. From the age 14, it was his type. In an interview, he said, I didn't like the screaming teenage types, saying they didn't know anything about life. I went for women of 25 or over. They were less trouble and more rewarding. He used to pass his sweethearts off as his mother's or older sister to avoid a scandal because his managers and advisors wanted him to keep the wholesome image. His first big show business romance was with a nightclub dancer who later accompanied him on tours posing as his mother. Frankie explained how they met. I first met her at a party when we were playing in LA. This gorgeous doll walked up, pinched my cheek, and said, Oh, isn't he cute? I told her, You're not so bad yourself, baby. You sure look good to me. I guess she was pretty shocked. She said, You shouldn't talk to your elders like that. I asked her, How about going to breakfast after your last show? Later, I bought some scotch and took her to my room. In show business, gossip travels fast. Pretty soon, I had a whole stick of women, one in every city. He even almost got exposed once, stating, when a newspaper reporter who had been introduced to one of my mothers in New York caught my act in Chicago and was introduced to another one of my mothers, I had a hard time convincing him that he had seen the same women in both cities, especially since they looked nothing alike. Frankie's management realized Frankie's marketability, and Goldner began to promote Frankie as a solo act and scheduled solo gigs for Lyman, causing tensions between the group while they were on tour in Europe. Around that time, Goldner sold his end of G Records to the other owner of G Records, a man named Boris Levy, a mobster. And before he did, he said Santiago and Lyman had written a song. During the tour, the teenagers were ignored. Frankie was the only one interviewed or given attention. They also dropped a miracle in the rain, but Frankie was singing by himself, and Goldner got another nameless group to record the background vocals. But when it dropped, it said Frankie Lyman and the teenagers. Members of the group rebelled against Frankie, and the tour in Europe was nearly sabotaged by fistfights and threats of a strike by fellow singers. When they went back to America, they got into an argument, and Frankie left the group. Not with the uh, the group in the background anymore. Do you want no, to talk no. about it? Or do you want to eliminate it? Well, it's not necessary. What what happened uh, with the group? Did they just leave on their own? No, they wanted to go as a quartet instead of a quintet. They figured they might uh, make it better by themselves. So. I see. Levy had successfully ripped them apart, as well as robbed the teenagers, and the kid who was once begging to sing was now the star. In September of 1957, Frankie left the group and his solo career started off with a decent hit, My Girl, which got him a record deal, as well as The Goody Goody, which he had even performed on The Ed Sullivan Show, a huge late night show back then on TV. However, Frankie was in no shape to become a solo act, and those around him weren't aware of that. Meanwhile, with Frankie gone, the teenagers dropped a new song called Flip Flop with a new lead singer. Like the name, it flopped, and they were done. Out of the showbiz, a tale as old as time. Frankie Lyman and the teenagers broke up when they were at the top. The music industry was still on the rise, so they never got to enjoy it, or got any money or any credit for writing Why Do Fools Fall In Love or any of their hits. They never saw a penny of it. Massive artists were recording these songs, like Diana Ross and the teenagers lived poor for the rest of their lives. The teenager's career barely lasted a year, and although Frankie's lasted longer, its popularity would soon dwindle, due both to his own vices and the fault of others. Frankie had a problem. Due to management, the public thought that he was squeaky clean innocent teenager, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Frankie was a sex and drug addicted teen, who was too big for his britches. As I said earlier, he started with pot when he was in great 
grade school. But once he got into show business, at the age of 15, he became addicted to the cure, aka heroin. Drugs were in the 50s everywhere, taking a lot of people off the normal course of life, and Frankie was one of them. Frankie became hooked to heroin at the age of 15, which severely harmed his career and life. The story of how he was introduced, heartbreaking. He was introduced when he was 15 by a woman who was nearly twice his age. He had learned to use the hypodemic needle during a New York party where a lot of musicians were shooting the stuff and a woman at the same party showed him how to skin pop, to prick the skin with the needle to get a mild kick. I never intended to get hooked on dope, he said. I knew it was bad and at first I was content to just skin pop, but as soon as I got daring, it wasn't long before I was injecting the stuff right into my veins. Once Frankie's record sales diminished and people found out Frankie was an addict, he became a no-no. Although everyone in the music industry at the time was on drugs, there were in prominent positions and Frankie, a child, wasn't. Even worse, his voice was changing and no one wanted to develop him. No one wanted to make the transition with him. Nobody wants to develop the voice of a young man. By the time he was 17, no one wanted any part of it. He was blackballed by all the nightclubs, booking agents, and recording companies. On top of Frankie's drug addiction, he was an actor during the late 50s and everyone will listen to radio and records, so most people didn't know he was black at the time. So when he came on national TV, the crowd was puzzled, and the TV company executives forced them to stay in their seats and cops were present as well. Poor Frankie stayed professional. To make matters worse, in July 19th, 1957, in the broadcast edition of Allen Streets, The Big Beat Rich, a television show he would dance with a white woman live on TV, Southerners were enraged. The show was canceled because of the event. All evidence of the show was physically destroyed. As a result, Frankie suffered another blow. In 1960, he made a short-lived attempt to shake the addiction, and although he had a lot of bad people in his corner, one man, Bob Redcross, Frankie's road manager for a while, tried to talk to him like a father. Frankie said, He told me about other entertainers whose lives have been cut short by addiction. People he knew personally. He made me move into his house on Long Island where he could be around me all the time to make sure I wasn't sneaking drugs. This was very eerie coming from Frankie. Knowing he would meet the fate his ex-road manager had tried so hard for him not to meet many years later. But at the time, Frankie was actually making good progress in conquering his addiction until a personal tragedy drew him back. His 39-year-old mother, ill for more than a year with terminal cancer, died unaware until the end that she even had the disease. Frankie recalled when he was older, we never told her the truth. She believed she was going to get well. One of the last things she asked me before she died if I had overcome my habit. I told her, Mama, don't worry. I'm doing the best I can. Bob's taking good care of me. Four months later, she died and despondent over his mother's death, the 18-year-old entertainer returned to narcotics to deaden his grief. By the early 60s, Lyman's record sales declined sharply and as a result of his drug habit picked up even more. By that time, drugs was what he was looking for. He was helpless in the face of his career. He still hustled some appearances, but the chance of reviving his glory days was long gone. And now he had lost his soprano voice he had had when he was a kid. He just didn't have the voice, and they would have to change the key five notes down and it would sound horrible. He had to lip sync on TV. At 19, he went to rehab in an attempt to become clean, and Levy would drop him from the record label. The next few years were him attempting to become clean but constantly falling back into heroin. In 1965, he tried reuniting with the teenagers, but it was a flop. Next year, he was looking for a break and had many short-term contracts with 20th Century Fox Records and Columbia Records, but couldn't last. After Lyman lost his popularity, he'd get into a couple serious romantic relationships until his passing. He met his first wife, Elizabeth Waters, in 1961, and in 1964, they got married. They even had a daughter, but she died after two days. Their marriage ended, and he relocated to Los Angeles, where he resumed his relationship with Zona Taylor, whom he had known since he was 13. She was so in love with him, she allowed him to destroy her home and money, and had to move in with her sister. They had a marriage in Mexico, but it didn't last either. 
Frankie was unable to get jobs. His friends went on and said, it really hurt to see Frankie. He was at his lowest point and there are performances of him lip syncing with his voice changed. He was no longer the Frankie his friends knew. He was always a brat and egotistical, but when he lost his voice, he was just another Joe. He would get to go to booking offices and Frankie would come in and beg the bookers to try to get him a job, begging the owner, asking if he remembered who he once was. It was a very sad sight, and in 1965, Lyman made his final TV appearance. His condition was horrible. His performance in 1965 had shown how far he had fallen. He was missing a tooth, his skin was in bad shape, the drugs took a toll on him. He would prowl the streets of New York, searching for old show business friends for a loan to buy a bag of heroin to jolt his shattered nervous system. A few hours later, he'd be back on the hunt. He'd sleep on the subway cars, and no one recognized him as a teenage star he once was, due to his hollowed eye, disheveled figure. He'd say, Dope peddlers and junkies treated him like a lick. Wherever he was lucky enough to find work, they lurked backstage, ready to get him hooked on a fix. In February of 1966, Frankie was arrested on charges of stealing a set of drums from a recording studio and pawning them to finance his habit. He insisted he was innocent, but lied a bit in that interview. His drug problem was getting worse. He was arrested again on a heroin charge on June 21st, 1966. He'd do anything at the time to fuel his addiction. In fact, at that time, Boris Levy ripped off an addicted Lyman, buying Lyman's publishing rights for only 1500 bucks, which went on to become worth millions and millions of dollars, although Frankie would have never lived to see any. But he was faced with a judge who said, you don't put this uniform on, we'll put another on you. And while he was stationed, he met his wife, who he changed his life for. Lyman was stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia, where he met a school teacher, Mia Eagle. While in the army, he would go AWOL, aka dessert, and perform at local bars. He would receive a dishonorable discharge. During his time, he met his third and final wife, Amira, a school teacher, and Frankie was living a clean life. However, it didn't last. He met a man named Sam Bray, who got him signed to Big Apple Records to record music. So in his eight month of marriage, he went to New York with his wife's blessing and opted to move in with his grandma in Harlem. He was set on making a comeback. He didn't want to become a has-been like Shirley Temple, Jackie Coogan, or Frank Robinson. However, everyone was aware he was an addict, and promoters of nightclubs and theater owners knew that few addicts succeed in shaking their addiction. His new manager didn't have a lot of money. He was a food inspector, so all Frankie had for him was his talent, gut, and veteran instincts. The odds were against him. Months before his death, Lyman gave his last interview saying, I know that many people aren't convinced that I've kicked the habit for good, but I know it, and that's the main thing. Sooner or later, the skeptics will get around to believing me. Meanwhile, I'm content to wait, Frankie said in his final interview. One of the neighborhood kids said, Hey, Lou, I heard that your brother died. So I laughed to my friend. I said, man, that's about the fourth time somebody told me that he had died. So since I was so close to my grandmother's, I said, well, let me go upstairs and say hello to my grandmother and we'll have a joke about uh, him dying again. And lo and behold, there was my father, policeman, and the person from the corridor. It was no joke. I didn't laugh that day. Skeptics turned out to be right. Heroin was used for celebrating his good fortune of finding his way back into the industry. The day before Frankie was about to go to the studio to record his new song, he was discovered dead in his grandmother's bathroom holding a syringe. Lyman was only 25 years old when he passed away on February 27, 1968. He died, flat broke, and by the 80s, two other of the teenagers were dead. Their surviving four. An overdose in New York was a dime a dozen. Rehabs were popping up everywhere, and his death wasn't even enough to bat an eye. Years after his death, Diana Ross made his name relevant again by re-recording his famous tune, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? There was a film made in 1998 about his life, and in 1993, Frankie and the teenagers were inducted into the Hall of Fame. He even got a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame with Madonna and many other celebrities writing for Frankie to get one. However, even in the grave, Frankie wasn't able to rest in peace. His inheritance sparked debate 
estate because he never divorced any of his wives. Lyman's name became worth millions and his inheritance started to be fought for. Why Do Fools Fall in Love became a timeless record, being played in commercials and licensed everywhere. During Frankie's life, he never received a cent of royalties. The songs would get big and all of a sudden everyone was like, where's the money going? Frankie was due royalty and his old manager Levy had robbed Frankie of his publishing so that it wasn't up for grabs. Myra, Frankie's final wife, asked Levy for her share, but Levy said he wasn't going to give it to her. He said Frankie had two other wives and took her to court. Myra eventually won and settled close to a million in royalties, likely much more today. The two teenagers who had originally written the song never got a cent. After losing the lawsuit in appeals court due to a statute of limitations on the case, essentially they had been cheated out of millions. Forrest Levy had walked away with what's worth over eight figures today. Frankie was snatched from the slums in Harlem at age 13 and catapulted into national prominence by a one in a million quirk of fame. The type of story you'd hear in a cheap novel from a cute kid who won over the hearts of music lovers across the country to towards the end of his life a heroin addict. Heartbreaking sight. A young man growing up in Harlem had 35% chance of making it to 65 and Frankie despite his massive success couldn't quite shake the fate of being born in Harlem. Rock and roll was originally a teen phenomenon and the first teenage rock star was Frankie Lyman. Frankie and the teenagers rejuvenated the music industry in the 50s. The girl group sound as well as many other Motown early groups were formed around Frankie and the teenagers dynamic. Some of the most accomplished musicians of the century such as Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, Ronnie Spector, The Chantels, The Temptations and many more were influenced by Frankie. In the end, Frankie's story makes a kid like me feel grateful for the time I was born in but also makes me realize how little the world has really changed.